The Senate opens the impeachment trial of Donald Trump today. They're going to start out by taking a measure that lays out the rules for the proceeding. The vote could take place any time today. Then the chamber can begin to weigh the charges. Joining us with his thoughts on this and what he thinks we can expect is Aaron Mate, host of Pushback with Aaron Mate. He joins us now via Skype. Great to see you, sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, Aaron. We always love your perspective on all of this. I mean, the media has told us all along that, you know, the next shoe is going to drop and then Republicans are going to change. They're going to come over to our side. And then it was the next thing and the next thing and the next thing. Here we are down to it. The trial is starting. Do you anticipate any significant Republican support for the Democratic position here? Maybe the Democrats <laughs> can get some Republicans to vote to hear some witnesses. But even if that happens, I still don't see how this turns out well for the Democrats. We know the bulk of the impeachment case so far, and as we've talked about previously on the show, I think it's pretty weak. Their theory might be plausible, but they never proved it. They never found a single witness to say that Trump actually linked the investigation's announcement by Ukraine to receiving military funding, which is the heart of this whole thing. So what I'm expecting is simply more just drawn out battles about process and whether to call witnesses, which is going to be exciting for legal analysts on cable news networks. But for everybody else, I just don't see how this attracts anybody. And meanwhile, what are the consequences? We've talked about before about how, for example, in the crucial weeks leading up to the first uh, primary con contest, the Iowa caucuses, Three of the uh, presidential candidates, uh, including Bernie Sanders, the, the candidate who, who I favor, is, are going to be off the campaign trail. So I don't think we're taking stock of the consequences and all this impeachment excitement, which I think really fundamentally comes is concentrated in a very small sector uh, of the American people, which is basically D.C. Uh, political and media elite. Right. And one thing I always talk about, Aaron, is about how the media, you know, they're not really able to cover two things properly at the same time. And so for every second that, like you said, we're going to hear endless comments about procedure and here's what's happening, live commentary, special live shows, what, you know, and New York correspondents are coming down to D.C. doing specials for their networks. You're not hearing about what's going on. You're not hearing about the current fights between Sanders and Biden on corruption or Social Security or the Iraq war. I mean, these are endless things. And these things were actually making an impact ahead of the impeachment cycle. And now we're not going to be able to litigate how the country's going to be governed going forward rather than on something that we already know the outcome of. Totally. And think about it from like a partisan perspective if you want the Democrats to win. So if you're an undecided voter or if you voted for Trump in 2016, but you're open to having your mind changed, or you simply stayed out, or, or you simply didn't vote at all, uh, and you're considering maybe voting this time, but looking for someone to speak to you and speak to your concerns, what are you getting from the Democrats? You're getting from, from the Democrats, once again, another all-consuming scandal that is focused on Democrats being upset at the uh, corruption being highlighted of one of their candidates. So with Hillary Clinton, it was the exposure of uh, Democratic Party emails, which showed major corruption inside the party. And now, while well, Democrats are upset that Trump might have wanted an investigation into Joe Biden's potential corruption, certainly the, the fact that his unqualified son uh, got a lucrative gig is an act of possible uh, conflict of interest and corruption. And meanwhile, you're hearing Nancy Pelosi say things like, all roads lead to Putin. And you're hearing Adam Schiff say that Trump undermined our national security and is threatening our, our, our democracy because he wanted Ukraine to announce an investigation into Joe Biden. It all sounds just totally hyperbolic and also completely divorced from all the issues you talked about. Yeah. I mean, and on the political part with Biden, now also, as we see with this whole situation unfolding with Bernie, where Zephyr Teachout put out a totally factually accurate and important op-ed, she's, she's an expert on corruption, on Biden's historic corruption over his career. Bernie comes out, which I think was a mistake, and feels the need under pressure to apologize for Biden. So you can see how this legitimate issue that is actually of central concern to voters and is a big part of why Donald Trump is in the White House, is now completely taken off the table in terms of Democratic primary discussion as we're weighing who would be the best nominee to ultimately go up against Donald Trump and get him out of office. Totally. And to me, it speaks to the central char characteristic 
of the Democratic Party leadership since they lost in 2016. They care more about protecting their own pride and their own privilege than they do about beating Trump. If they actually cared about beating Trump, then they would transform as a party and start speaking to the uh, very real grievances that Trump exploited in 2016 and start talking about taking on Wall Street and taking on militarism. All things Trump promised to do, but of course he has not done. Democrats could pose a a genuine alternative and have real policies, but instead, what have they done? They've come up with excuses for why they lost in 2016, blaming Russia, uh, blaming Bernie Sanders, blaming everybody everybody they can, and consuming the country in these national scandals in the process. And we're seeing it even today with Hillary Clinton coming out and attacking Bernie Sanders and saying that nobody likes him. I thought we're not supposed to criticize Democratic candidates, uh, especially during, uh, during an impeachment trial. But now it looks all of a sudden as if Hillary Clinton has forgotten that and the rules do not apply to progressives like Bernie Sanders. I mean, the Democratic leadership just looks like a joke. Right, and that's the great irony, is that Bernie didn't even talk about her emails or the Clinton Foundation. He did not even discuss the central corruption at the root of Hillary Clinton's entire public life. And she still is saying, I mean, she thinks she said nobody likes him, he's a career politician, it's baloney, the idea, she she said, it's quote, sad that people have bought into it. A, you know, leaving her bitterness and and all that other (laughs) aside, it doesn't really work if you don't touch this, Aaron, because it's all going to come out. It doesn't work at all, and it's really sad to see them continue to drag down uh, the country in this and to attack the candidate who actually poses, I think, a real uh, a real threat to Donald Trump, at least if we take the polls seriously. Uh, Hillary Clinton said today said in this uh, comment uh, that that is being circulated now from her upcoming multi part documentary that nobody likes Bernie Sanders. He's the most popular politician in the country. (laughs) <laughs> and yet, Democratic leaders, leaders like her are, are devoting uh, resources not just to attacking him, but then to sidelining him with things like impeachment. So to me, it's all doubling down on failure, and it's, it's dangerous heading into 2020. Well, yeah. and not to mention, she also says she would not commit to backing him if he were the nominee, which, God forbid, if Bernie ever said that about any Democratic candidate or Tulsi Gabbard, if she dared to say that about any candidate, everyone would lose their minds. But when Hillary says it, you know, I guess <laughs> it's it's OK. Yeah. Um, but the other thing about this, Aaron, that has been sort of personally frustrating for me, probably for you, too, is as someone on the left, you know, that my critique of Trump focuses more on his, his failed promises, on the, you know, elite legal war that he almost got us into, those to me seem like much issues of graver import than what happened in Ukraine. But because I hold that view, I'm like smeared as, you know, a Trump apologist or a Trump friend or like paid by Russia and Putin, et cetera. It's just there's so much sort of militant groupthink within the Democratic Party that there is no room for dissent whatsoever. It's really insane. And, you know, I understand anybody who was uh, who bought into this whole Russiagate thing because it was all average people were presented with for two years. And the people who are paid to do their jobs to present the news and present the facts, this is what they presented to the public as being the thing that was going to bring down Trump. And so for people who were, you know, understandably uh, scared at Trump's presidency and wanted to see an end to it, I get why it had an appeal to a wider public. But unfortunately, it was based on fantasy, it, and it was, and it, it had a very particular uh, set of motives behind it, which was basically instead of uh, having honest self-reflection amongst Democrats as to why they lost in 2016, and having them go to the process of transforming and taking on real issues as you're talking about, it was done so they could basically protect their position and avoid any kind of self-reflection and blame other people for their failure in 2016, and the result has been toxic and. I don't see how uh, you have a situation where Trump's political opposition is devoted to conspiracy theories that he's controlled by Putin, and now again to relatively marginal issues like whether or not he pressured Ukraine to open up an investigation into Biden and to how far he went to do that, with very thin evidence, by the way. I don't see how you're going to help win over enough people to beat Trump in, in 2020, and that's just one aspect of the tragedy here. Yeah, Yeah. I think it's an excellent point, Aaron. Thank you for joining us, as always. Great to see you, Aaron. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Next on Rising, who is the leading 2020 contender amongst college students? College Pulse's Taryn Klein. He's going to explain. That's next.